First up is my colleague Bhaskar Chakravorty from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Bhaskar is Associate Dean of International Business and Finance at the Fletcher School, and he's the founding executive director of Fletcher's Institute for Business in the Global Context. The Institute's objective is to connect the world of business with the world. Bhaskar is a regular columnist for the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Indian Express, Huffington Post, and a former columnist on innovation for the Washington Post, among other venues. In a 20 plus year career, he's been an advisor to CEOs and senior managers of more than 30 companies in Fortune 500 and worked across the Americas, the EU, Asia, and Africa. He's also just a wonderful person and great colleague to us across the whole university. So, Bhaskar, you're up first. Well, thank you, David. Can everybody hear me? Okay, because I can't hear myself. I'm so uh, stunned by the space. And uh, uh, it's, it is such an honor to see the sea of faces, literally, in this, uh, in this uh, spectacular space. So my topic uh, is to share with you a few insights and a few vignettes of our digital planet. Now, when I say a digital planet, uh, I, you know, I have a little piece of the digital planet right here in my pocket. And if I could ask any of you who hasn't switched off their phone, per David's instruction, to just kind of hold it up and just uh, wave it. So at least I'll feel like a rock star standing on, uh, on this stage. Uh, I, I, I'm already feeling a little bit like that. Now, um, we are all carrying a piece of the digital planet in our pockets, in our purses, in our bags, on our tables. And any one of those little magic wands that we have uh, is at least a million times as powerful as the computer that guided uh, the Apollo mission and put a man on the moon. Just imagine that. And it hasn't been that long since uh, we did that. So here we are, grappling with this spectacular transformation that uh, at least some of us have lived through and the rest of us have read in history books and quite often go to the digital planet called the internet and, uh, and learn more about it. Now let me give you a few, uh, a few vignettes in terms of uh, what the digital planet is looking like today. Now, quick show of hands, how many of you have a teenager at home? Okay, so quite a few of you. Do you know where your teenager is? Well, here's where your teenager might be. I mean next Tuesday, hey, you there. What? Hey, what? There, what? Yeah. Hey, hey, you there. You there. Hey. There, there. Oh. Hey, you there. Okay. And I see you over there. I'm done. I want you to come here. See this? No! God, please, no! 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 Well, the second part was meant to be you. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so don't get scared. Don't pull out your phones and call home to see where they are. This is uh, the fastest growing mobile app that has basically hooked an entire demographic from the ages of 10 to about 23, and uh, is the hottest piece of social media uh, that, is, uh, that is going around and has pretty much Im imprisoned a large part of our, uh, our, our population. Okay, another quick show of hands. We're just coming off of Thanksgiving, about to head into uh, the holiday period, and this is the time when the American economy really relies on to, uh, to, to, to rise up and push that growth rate above you know, 2%, 3%, whatever it, it, it happens to be, regardless of who's uh, you know, occupying the White House. We all, as consumers, drive the American economy during this period. How many of you braved the crowds or uh, went on the internet on Black Friday or Cyber uh, Monday? Okay, uh, seems like almost the same number that have teenagers at home, so maybe there is some correlation. Now it turns out that Cyber Monday and Black Friday are two momentous days for the American economy because depending on how those days perform in terms of sales, the American economy rises, falls, or stays flat. Now it turns out that no matter how momentous those two days are, they don't even come close to another day called Singles Day, which happens in China just a few weeks before. It actually happens on November 11th every year. And on Singles Day, just one online company 
Alibaba manages to do more sales than all of Black Friday and Cyber Monday here in the United States. And that is done on the digital platform. That is another piece of the digital planet. Swinging around to a different part of the digital planet, this is Sarah. Sarah went to school at Suffolk University and then went back to her home in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Ba went back at a time when the price of oil is not where it used to be and the Saudi economy is not where it used to be. So people kind of have to work to uh, kind of put, uh, you know, uh, uh, make ends meet even in Saudi Arabia. And it turns out that Sarah can't drive, but Sarah can start a company. In fact, Sarah is part of a massive ecosystem of budding female entrepreneurs in Saudi Arabia, and they've set up shop on a platform called Instagram. So it turns out that Saudi Arabia is a hotspot for female entrepreneurship, a much hotter hotspot than New York City. Imagine that. That's what the digital planet has enabled us to do. And of course, I know we do want to kind of move on from those headlines that dominated this past year or it seems like the past 10 years. Uh, these are a few of the headlines that uh, uh, crossed our desk. And uh, none of these headlines have been produced by either CNN or New York Times or Fox News or any reputable news outlet. Uh, most of them, or headlines like these, actually came out of the fervent imaginations of teenagers in Macedonia. They pretty much just made up the headlines. And it is amazing that how these made up headlines played a significant role in the US presidential elections. And these Macedonian kids, they didn't have a political ax to grind. They just wanted to make a little bit of money. And, uh, and here you are the digital planet. So we were all worried about Vladimir Putin playing a role in the US elections, actually the Macedonian teenagers who probably had an even more profound effect. So why is this kind of phenomenon coming up in Macedonia, in Saudi Arabia, in China, in Africa, in practically every part of the world in its different forms and in the capital of this digital planet, Silicon Valley, most of the companies that are popping up that all our kids and our students want to go and work for, most of those companies actually don't really make money. And I actually asked this question of Eric Schmidt, chairman of Google, when he visited Tufts a couple of years back. And he said, it's very simple. It's very simple. If you give me a billion customers, I'll figure out how to make money. And that is the principle that's driving so much of the activity on the digital planet. And as a byproduct of that, we're ending up seeing the kinds of uh, outcomes uh, that we have seen, almost these nonlinear connections between different parts of the world and some unexpected outcomes like a hotspot of female entrepreneurship in a country where females can't get into a car and drive to their entrepreneurial place of work. So with all these transformations going on, we at the Fletcher School are profoundly interested in global phenomena, trends and patterns, and trying to interpret what's going on there and trying to look ahead. So we wanted to look at what were the digital weather patterns around the world and how might they be changing and where are the kind of the hurricanes forming and where are the areas of high pressure and low pressure. And in order to do that, we created something called the Digital Evolution Index. It's the first measure of its kind of the nature of transformation of the global society from a physical past to a digital future. Now I'll flash a few pictures for you and these pictures are just the results of what this index shows us and I'll just interpret them for you very, very briefly. So this graph captures two things. On the vertical line, along the vertical lines, you go from south to north, the more highly evolved countries will show up from south to north. And on the horizontal, as you go from left to right, you go, to, uh, uh, you go from low momentum or low growth to high growth. So the absolute level of digital evolution vertically and the pace of change of digital evolution horizontally. And here are 50 countries in the world, half of them advanced 
or industrialized countries, the other half developing countries. And here's where they fall in our new digital atlas. Now, this may be a little hard to read, so I'll organize them a little bit. So I've got them organized in roughly four different areas. There is one cluster of countries that we call the standout countries that have very high level of digital evolution in terms of digital engagement, digital penetration. People are using it for commerce, for communication, for political activism, uh, for entertainment, and all kinds of other acti uh, uh, activities, and also a very high momentum of change. Then there are the stall out countries where the evolution level is high, but they're kind of falling backwards or they're basically they're flattened out. Then there are the watch out countries that are essentially not doing well on either measure. And then the breakout countries that are not that highly evolved, but bursting out of the box. And uh, uh, they have tremendous uh, 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 momentum behind them. Now, what does this all mean in terms of understanding patterns and what we can do with it? So I'll just share a couple of things with you. One is you can see some interesting patterns as one finds one's way across this map. For instance, let's, let's look at our, our colleagues across the Atlantic Ocean and where they sit on this map. You'll notice that most of the major European countries are in the stall out zone. They're in the stall out zone. Now we have heard in the past year of how many crises have been layered on top of each other in Europe. There's been an existential crisis, there's been a Greek crisis, there's been a migrant crisis, there's been terrorist crisis, terrorism crisis, there's been political crisis. This, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the most profound crises, an invisible crisis in Europe, a digital crisis. And this is one of the reasons why there's a lot of concern in Europe about Europe essentially falling behind, not only in digital advancement, but also in areas of innovation, and digital happens to be the engine of innovation in large parts of the world. Now here's another interesting pattern. See where the breakout countries are, and you can see where these big bubbles I've got on this page. These bubbles represent big population clusters. The world's major population clusters are the ones where there's a tremendous amount of change happening. And I'm here in New York. I don't need to uh, uh, preach to this choir. When there is a combination of momentum and population, money follows. And a combination of momentum and population is driving a lot of private equity money, venture money, and so on. And what that translates into is more funding for new ideas and entrepreneurs. And over time, we'll begin to see a shift away from Silicon Valley and towards Shenzhen or towards Bangalore or towards other major clusters like this, which has implications for a lot of us in practically every field that we dominate. Now, a natural question that often has come up every time I've talked about this to audiences is if I'm in one of the kind of the not so nice zones, if I'm in a breakout part, how do I break out of that and become a standout? So just last month, I was in Indonesia. I was talking to uh, the folks at the Bank of Indonesia. And I observed uh, to them that at the current course and speed, it would take them 13 years to get to where their neighbor Singapore is today. So they asked me the question, what would, he, what would we need to do to get to Singapore in five years? And it turns out that our analysis helps get them an answer to that question. So this work has very specific actionable policy implications. So for instance, I could have a conversation with policymakers which help them understand where the gaps are between them and Singapore and how they would need to change some elements of their infrastructure, their political systems, their laws, their regulations, uh, the, uh, how, they, uh, how uh, uh, education systems and other, other, other uh, elements uh, work in the economy. Now I'm gonna close with a recognition that this digital edifice is only growing. And the more it grows, the taller this tower becomes, the more unstable it is gonna be. But we are still completely reliant on it. This magic wand that we're all carrying does so many things for us. And what we do is we place an enormous amount of trust in this somewhat unstable uh, edifice. And if we didn't have this trust, we'd basically put our phones away. Here's a quick quiz. I've put three things on this, uh, on this uh, uh, slide. A fancy car, 
Facebook, and a picture of the Hadron Super Collider, which basically smashes subatomic sub particles at the speed of light in order to discover some fundamental principles of particle physics, including the origins of all of us, the origins of the universe. Which of these do you think has the most lines of code? And the reason why that question is interesting is more lines of code, more vulnerable you are to basically uh, uh, you know, something going wrong. The taller that shaky tower is. Car, I have a car, I have heard Facebook. Particle collider, no. Okay, so we've got a, a couple of candidates here. It turns out that the winner is the car. And so even if you don't own this specific car, the car that you probably drove in or dropped you off at this wonderful venue is one of the most vulnerable pieces of equipment that you're in touch with. And this vulnerability could come from this gentleman, <laughs> or it could come from all the people that were identified or named or agencies that were named by this gentleman, Edward Snowden, or it could come from non-state actors, pretty much from anywhere in the world. And we are basically building this tower as we're going on. Now, I don't want to leave you with a sense of you know, despair and, 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 and nervousness in terms of where the digital planet is going, because you know, it is interesting to ask the question, where do we go from here? Now, at the Fletcher School, we've created an institute called the Institute for Business in the Global Context. And the idea is to try and understand how does business, technology, and innovation interrelate with the wider context that includes everything from politics to security to development to humanitarian issues to technology. And we ask our students, I ask my students every year to give me a sense of where we're headed because students, and we have one of them here, are the best guide to the future because they are the future. So here are some covers of The Economist magazine that you have never read but you might read 10 years from now. These are covers produced by my students for the year 2026. A bit of a grim view from some students, some utopian views from others. So it's a mixed bag, a combination of pessimism and optimism. Within a few hours of the Nepal earthquake, the Digital Humanitarian Network was activated by the United Nations to carry out a number of different missions, one of them was to look through social media and find urgent messages. So what we did is we used a new platform called uh, Micromappers, which crowdsources the filtering of social media information to quickly find those messages that have to do with urgent calls for help. So this is one of our students, His name is Patrick Meyer. Patrick Meyer uh, was uh, uh, studying uh, in some darkened hall at the Fletcher School uh, when he heard about the earthquake in Haiti. Uh, one of his fellow students, his then girlfriend, Christine, was in Haiti, and he was terrified as to what had happened to her. So he created something called a crisis mapping network. Essentially, it's a way to grab all the social media, the data from the people who are out there, and be able to identify where uh, uh, the crisis is happening and how public safety can get to it. So I started with a comparison of our uh, smartphones and how much further we've come from the time when we landed men on the moon. Today's challenges are landing men right here and women right here on Earth. And these smartphones and their, uh, uh, you know, their, their, their parallels are actually helping us find these people on Earth. So the prognosis, ladies and gentlemen, despite all the vulnerabilities, is good because it's people like Patrick and thousands of others, many of whom are Tufts alumni, who are making that transformation. So I just want to leave you with a piece of happy news. Uh, Patrick and Christine got married. <laughs> and they have a little baby. So thank you very much.